Sunday. As uh, we discussed in the first service, Texas did not get the memo on the first weekend of fall. Uh, but I think it's been like that, uh, in fairness to Mother Nature, uh, it's been like that for some years now. It just always hits you different, right? You complain about the heat, then you get the cooler weather, then you complain about the cold and get, you know, you want the heat. That's just life, and that's what we do. Uh, but, it, but it's really strange that, um, and, and it happens again every year at the start of fall and football season, playing football or watching football when it's 100 degrees outside just feels really uh, unnatural. But um, praying that uh, the Lord will be kind to us in the coming uh, days and weeks and bring some cooler weather. Listen, before I start, um, it's been a joy to... Um, really get to know some of you and share with you um, over the last few weeks. Um, and uh, last Sunday evening um, was one of those moments. Uh, I was able to attend your prayer night and really encouraged. About roughly 50 people showed up, but um, and it lasted only an hour. I mean, that wasn't like what I was thinking going in, but it was efficient, right? Everybody's busy and everybody's distracted. But it was a sweet um, just time of, of intentional prayer, um, and the, the team that put that together did, did really a, a good job. Um, and then even some of the little huddles that we were in together and praying with one another was just really, really sweet. And uh, so I, I believe they may plan some more maybe. It, it, it felt like that. It seemed like that. So I, I don't want to answer that for them, but if they do... Try to be mindful of that, and I, I know you would be blessed. And it really matched the scripture that last Sunday morning, and I wasn't expecting that. Um, Aaron, is is that your fault, Aaron? Yeah, you. And then who was the gentleman that really that led led that effort? Bob. Okay, is Bob here? He's probably serving somewhere. That's what Bob's doing. Anyways, give Bob um, a thanks for me. So. <clears throat> Um, let me invite you to turn to the book of Philippians. Um, one more Sunday next week, uh, you'll be in this wonderful little power gospel packed book. While you're turning to chapter four in Philippians, um, let me just piggyback uh, that was mentioned off of that video, the Reach Texas offering, uh, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, who I'm privileged to work with. Um, all of that made possible when churches cooperate financially and, and of course, uh, autonomously uh, on their own, voluntarily, um, but, but theologically as well. Um, and so really grateful for that, whether it's church planning, revitalization, as our brother mentioned, um, disaster relief, probably tugs at the heartstrings the most, and all of that is made possible when churches give. But also, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering coming up. Um, 100% of that, um, and to, to international missions, which right here in your own um, congregation, you've got some uh, retired, some semi, do they know, Aaron? Do they, a second I'm calling on you. They, they know your background, right? It's like top secret. Um, he's like Mission Impossible, really, <laughs> minister. I told him that at lunch a couple of weeks ago, but... <clears throat> The Lottie Moon Christmas offering, 100% of that goes to, to support almost 5,000 missionaries, not quite, but, but um, to, to places that we can talk about and places we can't, where families give up everything to go overseas to, to preach and teach the gospel to places that most of us would um, uh, shiver by the sound of it. And then Easter, the... Um, Annie Armstrong Easter offering, that, that's North American missions. So all of that, in addition to what you give on a weekly basis, what I, what I loved about the SBTC, even as a pastor, never even dreaming that I would um, uh, ser serve in this capacity, out of every dollar you send, 45% stays in state, 55% goes out of state, to national, international causes, um, and I get to do what I do off of that 45%, not all of the 45%, but just like a little sliver there, right? Um, but we, 
we can do that. And I think there's, historically, there's never been a state convention that has given away that much of her budget annually. Um, and that, so it's, it's really special. Um, so, so thank you. And that's what we've been doing for 100 years as Southern Baptist. Some of you are like, oh, we're at a Southern Baptist church? Surprise, we are. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm really thankful that when we all get to, to heaven, right, that, uh, well, those who know Jesus, right, those who get to heaven, there's not going to be corners for Baptists and Methodists and, you know, and, and, and maybe, but not. I mean, it's going to be one. Um, we'll be at the lunch table, the Baptists. That's where we'll, we'll be, but... <clears throat> By the way, they all, all denominations, we all eat, right? And they all say the same thing. Like we're the ones that value that. But anyways, all right, Philippians chapter 4, um, verses 8 and 9, speaking to you for a few moments on three types of thoughts. Um, are there less? Sure. Are there more? Certainly. But for our purposes this morning, we're going to talk about three types of thoughts thoughts. Um, let me read these two verses, pray, and then we'll dive in. Um, eight and nine of Philippians four. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, he's like, I'm landing the plane, right? Okay. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any moral excellence, any virtues, basically, and if there is anything praiseworthy, he's not suggesting that there isn't. He's saying there is. He says, dwell on these things. Think on these things. Verse 9, do what you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Father, would you speak to us now? Encourage our hearts. Save the lost. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Three types of <clears throat> thoughts. Depending on where you learned your Latin, cogito ergo sum, philosopher, 17th century French philosopher, Rene Descartes. Maybe you know that term. I think, therefore, I am. Somebody paid attention in philosophy class. Um, I think, therefore, I am, who revolutionized, right, some philosophical um, uh, learnings and living, and just really these philosophers changed the world. One other philosopher, Thomas Edison, not really, but it just went so well. He says, 5% of people think... 15% of, excuse me, 10% of people think they think, and 85% of people would rather die than think. Think on that. As much as I would love to give credit to Edison and Descartes, um, there are some uh, thoughts Similarly, that, that really predate these wonderful men. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks, so he is. So Descartes gets all the credit, but um, we could argue that these were there in antiquity and even beyond. Um, so we're going to talk just for a few moments on these three types of thoughts. But before I do, I just want to um, forewarn you that, um, that, that I'll share some things that challenge your thoughts. Um, one specifically, one of my favorite <clears throat> authors and philosophers and, and really apologists, um, even though that is not my field, J.P. Moreland, who um, is, is not credited near enough, nearly enough. He's not in our camp. He's a professor at Biola University in California, um, uh, part of the Vineyard Church. Um, and he wrote a book some 25 years ago uh, uh, titled, Love Your God with All Your Mind, The Role of Reason in the Life of the Soul. And Moreland speaks 
to this, and it sounds really funny me saying this, because I wouldn't consider myself an intellectual, and many others may not consider myself an intellectual, probably because of, of my high emotional being, like just that state that I'm constantly in. But um, he speaks to this anti-intellectualism that has crept into the church, specifically the American church, American evangelicalism. He, he says that uh, it is, well, he gives many arguments, but one of the arguments that has really um, changed, when I first read this 20 years ago, changed the trajectory like I never would have imagined my ministry, or at the very least, my philosophy of ministry, my approach to ministry. And he says, one of the things he says is that anti-intellectualism has crept into the church primarily because of how we do church. Meaning, in the New Testament, um, and I'm not saying I agree with everything Moreland says, right? I tend to be drawn to the ones I disagree with some, but learn from. He says he can find nothing in the New Testament scriptures that supports this idea of senior pastor. You uncomfortable yet? He says, what I do see is a plurality of pastors or a plurality of elders. But yet, because of our preconceived notions and upbringing that we have uh, really um, created these superstar pastors, right? You might even find yourself in that trap um, where, like, look, I, I just didn't like the way the guy looked. He wasn't tall enough, short enough, skinny enough. You know, he wasn't smart enough. He did just really, you know, um, it's all about me. And yet this is the very problem that Moreland says. And, and it comes from a good place, right? It comes from a good place where it's brother so-and-so's church. And I'm thankful for the faithful, right? Who, where we can look to men and look to women and say, these believers are why I'm drawn to the faith or why I've come to faith or why I'm growing in my faith. But Moreland says that we have, we have really um, uh, created for ourselves, paraphrasing, some, some really terrible habits. And one of those habits are the or spiritual discipline of thinking. So we come, we might serve a little bit, but it's like feed me, right? Where singularly there's a guy on stage and, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for pulpits and I'm all for opening. Well, you got to open scripture at least, right? And, but but we're, we're not totally and 100% dependent upon one man. As a matter of fact, that's often what gets us in trouble. When I meet with churches that are pastorless, I often ask, well, how many deacons do you have? I say, well, we got more than one. They usually say more than one. Well, that's plurality of deacons. Why would you have more than one deacon? Why would you have more than one volunteer or one minister? Well, because one person can't do it themselves. The same is true for the pastor. We see a plurality of deacons. We also see a plurality of elders in Scripture. But yet, we are dependent upon one person that makes or breaks us. And actually, what's happened is American Idol, when, you know, or actually even before American Idol, um, it was, what's that guy name? That, that guy's name, Ed McMahon? What's, it, what's that show called? Star Church. It started then. That has crept into the church. Well, I got to vote on this guy. I got to vote on that guy. Yeah, just, you know, I, I get it. I understand. But listen, I'm challenging you. And Paul, I think, doesn't, well, he does later in other places affirm this idea of plurality. But what he is speaking to is not to professional clergy. He's speaking to the people to think. Maybe Edison was right. 5% five of, five of you think. 10% of you think you think. And 85% of you would rather die than think or be challenged to stretch, right? 
Moreland says, freedom was traditionally understood as the power to do what one ought to do and not what one wants to do. We're going to see that here in just a minute. I promise I'm getting there. What about Matthew twenty two thirty seven? 37, right? The great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Moreland says, we've got that down, American Christendom. But there's one part that's missing. Not in Scripture, it's missing in us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul. This, this is, you know, again, and this is coming from an emotional being. Right. That's why we want emotions and, and you got to have it. But there's one other element, the mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Faith is built on reason. To think. Just think. Critical thinking. So what does that do for us here with the role of reason in this text? There's three types of thoughts. <clears throat> Number one, I won't read Matthew 12, but just in your notes there. Number one, there's attentive thoughts, right? Be attentive to the way you're thinking and what you're thinking. Be intentional about the way you're thinking and what you're thinking. So attentive thoughts would be number one. Number two would be virtuous thoughts. This is Virtue. This is moral excellence that he's speaking to here in verse 8. There's eight things that he lists, right? These eight virtues. These aren't the only virtues, but he's speaking to eight right here. And what he says, I love this, finally. Part of me wants to think that he's saying, would you finally listen? But he's not. He's saying, finally, brothers and sisters, let's descend into that airport. Let's bring this thing home. I've given you a defense for gospel partnership. I've given you a defense for unity. I've given you a defense for Christ-centered theology. I've given you a defense for ministry, your witness to the world. And now he's saying, here's one more. Virtuous thoughts. He's saying, fix your thoughts. Another way to say that, he's saying, meditate. Donald S. Whitney in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life is a Must, speaks to multiple disciplines. I can't remember the the, the number, 12, 14, 15. Um, but, but there's one of his chapters or one of his disciplines. He speaks to Bible intake. He speaks to meditation, right? Meditating on these things. Reading it and reading it slowly. Reading it carefully. Reading it thoughtfully. But no, what, what do I do? What do I, I just want to check the box. I read it. I, didn't even rem, I don't even remember what I read. But because it's on my daily read list, that I read through the Bible in the year, like, what? That, that's so American. <laughs> like, what? Listen, my point is, I'm not, I'm not dogging that because I do it too. What I'm saying is, is I just got to check off that box. And yet I haven't internalized this, right? I haven't been attentive to my thoughts. And he's saying, here's, here's some things you need to think about. Look at this. What's true, what's noble or honorable, Justice, purity, love, good, moral excellence, again, or virtue, and praise. He's saying, fix your thoughts on these eight things. And yet, the person comes in and says, well, it's Jesus and only. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter. No, it does matter what you think. And if it wasn't for the thinkers that have gone before us, where would we be? That's Moreland's argument. Again, it sounds awfully strange, me saying anti-intellectualism. But he's speaking to me. That, that, is, that is resonating with me because uh, I'm in such a hurry and I'm constantly moving. I never 
learn the discipline of silence and stillness. Oh, my wife and my family would love for me to practice silence. Some of you right now, maybe. These virtues fix your thoughts on these things. Love your Lord, love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Faith is built on reason. And then, number three, working thoughts. I love this. Put into practice what you've learned. He says it. Do what you've learned. Do what you've received. Do what you've heard. And do what you've seen. Paul is bold. He says, in me. This is that apostolic authority, which, by the way, um, if anybody titles themselves apostle something, as many of preachers who have gone before me say, just run, right? Just run. I do believe there's apostolic angst and a spirit, right? But Paul is, and Paul is saying this with not, not arrogance, but with boldness and confidence. I love this about Paul. He says, he says, do what you've learned, do what you've received, do what you've heard and seen in me. In other places, he also says, follow the, other, the, 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 the example of others. Some of you are here right now because of that faithful saint, that woman who taught VBS or Sunday school or greeted you kindly, that, that minister or that pastor or that deacon or that elder who was kind in your hour of need. And you said, there's something different. This is what Paul is saying, the working thoughts, practicing you, uh, these, these very virtuous things, watching and doing. What they saw is what they heard and ultimately what they did. I love, and I know other churches do it, uh, I love that, that at the end of your service, <laughs> without fail, whether it becomes monotonous or mundane or repetitive to you, that's the idea, by the way. You are not dismissed, you are sent. Listen, you've got to be equipped, right? And I'm talking by others and encouraged and sharpened and spurred on by others. But to do these things, to learn these things, and not banking on one or two individuals. You, that same spirit that, that empowers Paul, is empowering you through your giftings. Moreland would say, strengths and weaknesses. As a matter of fact, because of those strengths and weaknesses... No one man can effectively lead a church by himself. I said it week one. I had no idea I would say it again. Calling a senior pastor is not your answer. I, say, I, I said that to first Bastrop. I met with their search team Tuesday night. 25, 27 years. Pastors retiring. Riding off into the sunset. What a faithful ministry. But the church has been there 173 years. One of the oldest churches in Texas. You think that church is there because of one pastor or the pastors? No, no. I would argue the church is there primarily because of the shed blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the people in the pews. I know that's hard for us to comprehend. Why would any one man want the weight of one church? There was one man who bore the sins of the church, who died, who lived and died, rose again for the church. And the fact that I want any church to take on my personality, to take on my strengths, to take on my weaknesses is frankly sheer arrogance. I always tell young pastors that I meet with and coach and, and just share with that 
Preacher, you should be ministering yourself out of a job. Which I may find myself after this sermon. But... This, 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 is, this is unorthodox for us today to think about, but it is the gospel. There's one hero of this message. There's one hero of the church. It ain't me, and it ain't you. Okay. Working thoughts. Watch and do. I like there in the journal, if you followed it on page 30, page 31, just some reinforcing passages here. 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16. I love what Paul says to young Timothy here. He's, he's speaking to Timothy, right? But, it, but it's for us. It's, 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 um, it's not to us, but it is for us. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. By the way, I didn't mention this in verse 9 earlier, but the reason you're sent is to minister to a hurting and lost world. That's it. It's not to come, to gather, to be fed only, me, myself, and I, right? It's not about that. As a matter of fact, it's not, about, it's not about your preference of music, although we have that. It's not about your preference of translation, although we should be thoughtful of that. It's not about your preference, I would even argue, of the preacher. It's, it's, it's this conduct, it's this speech, it's this love, it's this faith and purity. And until I come again, Paul says, give your attention to the reading, the public reading of God's word, to the exhortation and teaching. That's what we're doing. Don't neglect the, neglect the gift that is in you. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. That would be the opposite of none or some. He says, think on these things, right? He says, pay close attention to your life. This is absolutely incredible right here. Pay attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things. For in doing so, this you will save both yourself and your hearers. Listen, stop worrying about the world that acts like the world. I'm convinced that I do that, that, that I'm, I'm quick to point out and judge, and, and you should judge, by the way, and I'm quick to diagnose everybody else's problems is a deflection or avoidance of my own. Paul says, judgment starts in the house. Why are we surprised when the world acts like the world? We need to be surprised when not only when we act like the world which we do but we need to be we really should be pleasantly surprised when we act like Christ this is the whole essence of these virtues that your life will save yourself and save others Romans 14 speaks to this it's mind blowing to me so your life is not about you. Your life is not about your preference. Your life is not about your comfort. Although we have those things and we need those things, right? Praise the Lord, thankful. But it's not. It's about, what did I say last week? I think it was your, your, your miseries for ministry. Some, something like that. Paul says... In a few verses prior, for me to live as, live as Christ and to die as gain. I butchered this in the first service. I have no idea why. But your life is not about you. So everything, every gift that you have, every 
thought that we are to have to meditate on these things is for the purpose of ministry. I said it five weeks ago. Every single one of us are called to ministry. Every single one of us, young and old alike, alike, good background, bad background, educated, uneducated. And many of the standards that we put on others, we ourselves could hardly keep up with. At least that's how I feel about my my own life. Let me close with this quote by the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He says, Be on the side of everything that is good. Be on the side that, it, that, that everything is good, and everything is right, and everything that helps. Right? Your, your actions, your behavior is predicated on your beliefs. As a man thinks, so is he.